Well hello Internet and welcome to part 4 of my assembly language video tutorial. In this tutorial we're going to talk about floats and I'm going to answer a question I received which is how to implement a switch statement inside of assembly language and on top of that I'm going to show you how to convert floats into binary which is sure to make people think you are very smart. So I have a lot to do so let's get into it. Okay, so the use of floating point numbers is provided by the Vector Floating Point Coprocessor, or VFP, which is what I'm going to call it from now on. And the VFP is basically going to provide single precision, or 32-bit, or double precision, or 64-bit floating point numbers, or it's going to allow you to store them. Now, every float, when it's stored as a binary number, is going to start off with a single number, which is going to tell you what sign it is. It's going to be 0 if it's positive or 1 if it's negative, and then bits 30 through 23 are going to represent the exponent, while bits 22 through 0 are going to represent the exact fraction. So now what I'm going to do, and the exact fraction is also known as the mantissa. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over and show you how to convert a fraction into what is known as the IEEE -E -E format binary. Okay, so let's say we have this number here, 0 0.40625, and we want to convert that into binary. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply it times 2, and then if you get a 0 here with a decimal number following it, you're going to put a 0 there to represent the fraction. You're then going to take this result, move it down here, multiply it times 2. If you get a 1 here, you're going to then put a 1 to represent the fraction. You're going to knock that 1 off of there, move the 6.25 in this situation down, multiply that times 2, and so forth and so on, until you multiply and you get a result of 1. At that point, you have created your fraction or converted your fraction into binary, and you stop. So in essence, 40625 is going to be equal to 0 0.01101, but we want to convert this into IEEE -E -E binary, which is going to be this giant number over here, and to do that, what we have to do is figure out how many decimal places we need to move the 1 over, so it'll be in the 1 position here. And then we're going to take that number, which is 2 in this situation, we're going to subtract it from 127 to get 125. That's going to give you this binary number right here. And you can see down here, this is a positive number, so this is the sign bit. That's going to give you a 0. You're going to move the exponent down here, which is going to be this guy right here. And then you're going to follow that up with the binary number, which is this giant thing right there. And that is how easy it is to convert a floating point decimal number into a binary float. Now we're not going to be able to store floats in register 0 through 15 like we did previously, so we're instead going to use the VFP or the Vector Floating Point Coprocessor registers that are provided to us. And those are going to be provided to us in registers S0 through S31 for single precision and D0 and D15 for double precision and each D register is going to be mapped to whatever two S registers that you are currently not using if you want double precision. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over and start working with these guys and show you some code. Okay, so here we are in Raspberry Pi and we're going to jump into Vim and start writing some code out here. Now of course right here we're just like always going to be telling the compiler where main is going to be located and then we're going to jump down inside of main and create some code here. Alright, so first thing we're going to do is get the address that is going to be associated with pi. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump down in the data section and create that first. And all I'm going to do here is just simply print pi out on the screen. So we're going to do, use a float here and I'm going to type in 3.141592 and then we're going to provide some output for print line to be able to use and that's just going to be the value of pi is and here we're going to put a percent sign in f for float and then on top of that we want to come in here and define that we want to use print f and then let's come in here and create our address for this so address pi and of course a link in the description is available that's going to have all this code to help you along and it's going to be heavily documented and I'm going to transcribe this video there so you will be able to read it. Okay, so all the stuff that we've covered previously, aside from this guy down here being a float now, that's the first time we've ever done that, has been covered. So the very first thing I need to do is get the address that is going to be associated with our pi value. So that is address and pi. I'm then going to use a new command 
called VLDR, and what this is going to do is store it inside of one of our, rest, our S registers, S0 in this situation, the value that I have associated with pi, which I have down here, right there. And to do that, I'm just going to point at R1. Then I'm going to use another command that's going to look a little bit complicated, but it's really not. VCVT is going to be used to convert between floats and integers. So what this guy is going to do is convert to binary 64. So what you're going to do is go F64, and then we're going to be converting from binary 32. So that's what that does right there. And then we're going to be putting this inside of D1, which is another register. This is going to be for double precision. And the reason why we're doing that is printf expects a double precision float to be used. And then after that, we're going to point at the register that we're currently using, which is S0. Now what we can do is load our output, so the print line is going to be able to print out our little message along with the value of pi. So load into R0, our output information. And then we're going to have to insert our floating point value in this situation into registers R2 and R3 to hold that double precision value. And printf knows if we are going to be using a double precision float that the value is going to be stored inside of there. So we're going to go in there and put that where it needs to be. And D1 is where we're getting that from. And then finally we are going to call printf. And there we go. So we just need to save that and then come in here and compile that. And it says we have an undefined reference to output. Let's see what my little error is I made here. Oh, I came in here, I just put out. What was I thinking? So there's output. Going to escape out of that, save it, come in here and compile. Everything compiled perfectly fine. And then come in here and run it. And you can see right there, the value of pi is 3.141592. And we were successfully able to print out a float value on our screen. So it was all well and good to be able to come in there and be able to print out that information. Now let's go and perform some arithmetic on that information. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in here and change a couple different things. And basically you are going to be able to perform two different types of, of arithmetic modes. If you remember back here whenever we have the registers of S0 and S7 and the registers of D0 through D3 what this is going to be used for is the scalar mode. Now how that is going to differ is basically the scalar is just going to store this information or these float values inside of there in their designated spaces. However, these guys over here, these other registers that are available to us, are what are called the vector mode. And if you choose to use those, the operation is going to operate with registers wrapping values from the first place where you decide to put a value onto all the other additional registers that you have available. But just to keep everything nice and simple here, I'm just going to stick with the scalar mode and perform some basic arithmetic so that we don't have to worry about how that information is going to be passed back and forth between all the other different registers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come down inside of my data section here and I'm just going to get rid of, well, let's just come out here and let's just delete all that and then let's throw some new numbers inside of here so I'm just gonna keep it simple have number one and of course this is still going to be a float and I'm gonna have this be 1.2345 and then I'm gonna have another number inside of here and you're gonna be able to perform different arithmetic asides from just regular addition I'm gonna do addition now because everything else works exactly the same and we're still going to output our different information here and here I'll just say 1.2345 plus 1.111 is equal to. Once again, we're going to throw a float inside of here along with a new line. And then we need to come up here and create our addresses that we're going to be using. So this is going to be number one and change this to address number one. And then we're going to do exactly the same thing for this paste that inside of there, change this to number two, and then change this to number two. And then we can move up inside of here and actually operate with these and show you how this arithmetic all works out. So once again, we're going to come in here and we're going to be loading these values inside of here. So this is gonna be number one, and we're going to store that float inside of register S0, except we're working with two values now. So let's just copy this and come in here and paste that inside of there. And then we just need to change this 
to register two, change this to number two. This is gonna be two as well. And then we'll change this to S1. And now we'll be able to come in here and add these values. And how we add values is we use a instruction called vAdd. And we're gonna put F32 inside of here. And what we're saying here is that we wanna add single precision floating point values. If we wanted to use double precision, if we wanted to use the D registers, for example, we would put F64 there instead. And then we're going to say that we wanna store this in S2. And then the two values we're going to be adding to each other are in S1 and S0. Remember once again that we are going to need to convert these to double precision so that they will be able to be used for, you know, for the printf function, because that's required. So we're gonna change this to S2 right there. And we can just leave this set for D1. We can then come down here, leave this exactly the same where we're getting our output. We then wanna come down here and make sure that we move our values into the proper registers for printf to be able to print them. We're going to need to put them in registers two as well as registers three, since they're floating point values. And then finally, we wanna print just like we did before. So everything's saved, let's quit out of that. Let's go and compile it and run it. And you can see right there that we were able to add two floating point values. We would also, and you can do this for homework, you'd also be able to perform different other arithmetic functions. So on your own time, you can check out how you can subtract floating point values, as well as how you can multiply floating point values, as well as divide floating point values. And there's a whole bunch of other different functions. You can use, get the absolute value, and you can even do things like square root. And I just leave it to you to be able to go in there and figure out all those other different functions that are available to you. And now I'm gonna show you how we can go in and actually compare floating point values. Let's jump back over into Vim again. Now basically the VFP has its own version of CPSR, which is what we use to normally uh, do comparisons between values whenever we were not using floating point values. And it is called the FPSCR instead of the CPSR. And it's gonna provide the same flags, N, Z, C, and V. And we're gonna be able to use conditional execution depending upon what values we have stored inside of floats. So let's come down here inside of our data section once again. And I'm just gonna change these values up a little bit. We have address for number one. Let's see, what do we wanna store in number one? Let's just one, two, three, four, five. That's perfectly fine. Eh, let's change it to four. Doesn't matter what it is. And then for this guy down here, let's just go in and give it a value of 5.678, just to be a little bit different. And then our output for this guy is also gonna be a little bit different. Let's change this to D, and I'm gonna put out a zero for false and a positive for true. And all I'm gonna do here is convert and figure out if the values are equal to each other or not. So I'm gonna say R numbers equal, and I'm gonna use printf here once again and we can leave these addresses exactly the same as we had them before because nothing else there has changed. Then we'll jump up inside of the main area. And once again, we're going to be loading in these different values, these floating point values into registers S0 as well as S1, just like we previously did. I'm gonna come in here and delete some of this other stuff though. Just delete all of this. So those are loaded inside of there. If you wanna compare values and set the flags so that we'll be able to perform the proper operations, just gonna go in there and go VCMP, and we're going to be operating on 32-bit values. Once again, if you wanna use the D registers, you're gonna put F64 in there instead. Then you're going to provide the two registers that you wanna compare the values for. You then wanna come in here and copy the flag set by FPSCR over to your ARM status registers. So VMRS is how you do that. And APSR, which it was a little bit easier to tell you what's going on here, but that's literally what's going on. And CV and FPSCR. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to conditionally assign different values depending upon if these are equal to or are not equal to. So I'm gonna just say move. If they are equal to, I want to move into R1 the value of one, which is going to represent true. Otherwise, I'm going to, if they are not equal to each other, I'm inside of R1, I'm going to put a value of zero. 
and you could also go and put MOV and check if they are less than or if they are greater than or if they are less than or equal to or if they are greater than or equal to and I leave that to you for your homework to check out how those work then once again we can now have our results set to the register and inside of R0 we're going to assign our output which is what we assigned down below and it's going to automatically put in either a 1 or a 0 depending upon if they are equal to each other or not and this is going to print and this is going to end the program and now we can jump out of here and we can go in and compile uh oh have a little error let's jump in there I typed in NNZCV silly error and then we come down here and over here and let's change that to that and let's jump out again and now if we go and make and compile this guy you can see are the numbers equal and the result comes back as zero and if we jump into vim just to make sure that our program is working the right way we can go in and give this the exact same value so let's just change this to 1.234 escape out of it again and we can recompile it and whenever we run it you can see it comes back as one so there's ways that we can both store floating point values and perform arithmetic on floating point values and then do comparisons against those floating point values and now i'm going to jump over and i'm going to answer the question i got which is how can we implement a switch inside of assembler okay so here i am inside of vim once again and basically what i'm going to do is i'm going to check a different values inside of a register to see if they're either equal to zero one or if i don't know i'm going to pop out a default uh, answer so i'm going to put out different output depending upon the results so i'm going to go output zero asciz and if it's equal to zero i'm going to say it's zero and if the value that we are checking is equal to one i'm going to say it's one and the default like most switch statements have is going to be like this asciz and in this situation i'm going to say i don't know what it is and in this situation i don't have any reason to use printf i just want to print out a simple message so since i can use all sorts of different c functions this time i'm going to use puts instead of printf jump up inside of main once again and right here is going to be the register i'm going to be checking i'm going to say register 2 is what i want to know and it has a value of 1 I then want to do a comparison for R2 as well to check that if it is equal to zero. And if it is equal, that's what BEQ is going to do for us. I'm going to say that I want to jump to the label called case zero, which I'm going to create here in a second. And then I'm going to do the same thing here for our other result. Let's just copy that, paste that inside of there. And here I'm going to go R2. I can use that again. I can then check if the value is equal to one. And in that situation, I'm gonna to jump to another label called case one. And otherwise I'm going to jump to a label called case default. And then I just have to create the labels for them. And this is in essence a switch statement. So we can say case zero. And in here we can go load into R zero, which is what I'm gonna to use to print my special output which is output zero and then after that i can go b end i'm going to do exactly the same thing here for case one just copy that there paste that inside of there and then i'm going to change this to case one and i'll change the output here to output one and then i can come in and also create our default case and for our default i'll just go output zero and put that output there. I'm not going to need the end here in this situation. And I'm not gonna need this additional case right here. And then down inside of the end statement, I will then print out our result by calling in BL and puts. And I just wanted to check, did I put global puts down there? Yes, I did. And everything else should be fine. And we can jump out of there and we can come in and we can compile it and then we can run it. And you can see right there, it's one pops back. So there you go guys, there is a whole bunch of different ways we can use floating point values as well as how we can convert a decimal floating point value into binary as well as how to implement switch inside of assembly language. And like always, please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.